Welcome to the anointed teaching preached at Church 316, the youth arm of the Fountain of Life Church. We hope that you be blessed as you listen to this message. Okay, so this morning, um, I want us to do a bit of Q&A, but before we do that, I'll just um, quickly run through some of the things that um, God laid in my heart over last week. I'll try and do it in 10 minutes. Pastor Shoba will be my timekeeper so I can keep to time. Amen. Okay, so last week we were talking about Joshua and a new season. And for some reason, I just couldn't get over Joshua. So I went further and I read through Joshua. And I realized that oftentimes, I'm sure we've heard the, the statement, um, new level, new devil, right? Um, I know some of us don't want new devils. But oftentimes when there's a new level, there are new challenges. It's like when you play a video game, right? Once you level up, your expertise has to level up, right? So, and, and I think that that was what happened to Joshua. Because in Joshua 4, God used some things that Joshua was familiar with. The first miracle that God ever did through Joshua was to part the river Jordan, correct? And how did he part it? He said they should carry the presence of God and put their feet in the water. Now, because Joshua was used to the presence of God, it was not a problem for him. And oftentimes, when we get into a new level, we try to do things the normal way. And you know, one of the questions God asked me this week is, are you able to identify me or recognize me when I take on a new form? Stay with me. Joshua um, 6. Sorry, Joshua 5, verse 13. It says, and it came to pass when Joshua was by Jericho that he lifted up his eyes and looked and behold, a man stood opposite him with his sword drawn in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? So he said, no, but as a commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped him and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take your, your sandal off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua did so. You see, God had told Joshua, you're going to take over Jericho. But when God took a form that Joshua was not familiar with, Joshua went, are you for us or against us? If the angel had said, I'm against you, he was ready to fight. Because that was what Joshua was used to. And oftentimes, God will sometimes come in a noise. And at other times, it will come in a silent voice. Sometimes, it will come upon Jesus like a dove and on his disciples like thongs of fire. But are you able to identify the different forms that God comes in? You know, when I was meditating and I was like, okay. Okay, while I was meditating on that. You see, the lady that was, the little girl that was possessed and was running after Paul in the New Testament and was saying, this man, you know, they are men of God. Was it she saying the wrong thing? No. But the spirit by which she spoke was wrong. Now, until you are able to discern that not all that speak God is really God. So what she was saying wasn't wrong. But the medium by which she was prophesying or saying it was wrong. And that's why Paul rebuked her, right? Peter, re Paul, yeah. Paul rebuked her and the demon spirit left her. Now, that's the same way it happened to Joshua. Joshua, you have been given this territory. When God wanted to do a miracle by you putting your feet and carrying the presence of God into the water, it wasn't difficult. You did not struggle with it because you were used to it. But the moment God take, took on the form of a man, and he sent the commander of his army, Joshua, you went out ready to fight because you are not used to this form that God has taken. And God is saying that in this new season, I will take on an unusual form. Sometimes I will speak to you through a donkey. But are you sensitive enough to be able to pick it when God is speaking through the unusual? Or are we so... Um, are we going to allow our, our senses overcloud the voice of God? I'm going to do an experiment. Before, I, I heard someone say it this week, and I totally believe it. It says that one plus one is always two, right? Plus, but one plus one plus God can be anything God says it is. I said I was going to do an experiment. 
Um, everybody, please close your eyes. Don't open your eyes except I say so. Don't worry, there's no right or wrong answer, so you can't, can't be wrong, right? I'm going to just ask some people to speak, and then you try and guess the person that spoke. If your eyes are opened, don't answer, because you're already cheating, right? All eyes shut, amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Who just spoke? Okay, all eyes still closed. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Who spoke? <laughs> I don't even know the person's name. All eyes still closed. Okay, who spoke? If you, if you are sure you know the person that spoke, can you just raise up your hand and say the person's name? Yeah. Love thee. She said love thee. Actually, he's the one that spoke. How come everyone else did not recognize his voice? Because you're not familiar with him. What happens is when your senses are shut, as often time as they will be to the mysteries of God, if you have not taken time to spend time with God, you will miss his voice when he takes on a form that you are not familiar with. And that's what happens to us most of the time. I still want to do another experiment. Let me use somebody else. Everybody, close, shut your eyes. I try to use people that are popular and people that maybe no one will know or maybe someone will know because you know the person. Just shut your eyes. Praise the Lord. Who spoke? You opened your eyes now. How would you know? <laughs> you see, that's another thing. Sometimes we use our senses to predict the move of God. What happens is you try to help him, but you miss his mystery. You miss the lesson that he's trying to teach you. Now, the, the last person that spoke, except the person that picked, no one else was able to get, get her voice, right? Because you don't know her. Because you are not familiar with her. That's why it's impossible for you to recognize the voice of God. Because we are used to using our senses. And that's what Joshua went after. Joshua went after the man to fight. Are you, you can open your eyes, amen. Before you close your eyes and sleep off. <laughs> open your eyes. Joshua went after him and said, are you for us or against us? Isn't it amazing that the angel did not answer, I'm for you? Even though in preceding verses, the Lord had told Joshua, I am with you anywhere you go. But the angel of God did not answer him. I am for you or against you. He says, I am the Lord of the angel's army. I'm not only for you, I'm who, I am with who is for me. So Joshua, this battle you are about to go in is not about you essentially. It's about the fact that I will be glorified in spite of you. So the earlier you conform your will and your ability into mine, that's what I believe the angel was trying to explain to Joshua. Joshua, I'm neither for you nor against you. I am the commander of the Lord's army. If you are for me, I will fight in this battle with you. But don't expect me to come for you if you're not for me. So when situation happens like this, some might will in this human race. Are you for God? Or are you against God? Are you with God? Or do you want God to align and confirm his will to yours? Or are you willing to confirm yours to his? Because oftentimes, even when we go to God in prayer, we are asking about God, confirm my will to your own. God, bless my business. God, do this for me. And sometimes God is saying, what about what I want to do in this situation? And what happened? When Joshua realized that this life is bigger than him, he fell down in worship at his feet. Joshua is not only about what you are used to. Sometimes it's about what God wants to do and the fact that he wants to be glorified. Another thing God told me is that every time you try to do it in your strength and you go in your ability, you miss the divine strategies that God will give you. And the important thing is that strategies trump resources. Think about that for a moment. 
strategy, a God-given strategy trumps whatever resources that you have. Imagine it, every time they had gone into battle, God always find, found a way to trim their soldiers. True or false? He would tell them, whoever is scared, go back. Okay, tell them to drink water so that I can trim it, so that you understand that in this life, it's oftentimes not by might, it's not by power. So he came and he gave Joshua the strategy to win this battle. I can almost bet that before now, Joshua felt that they were going to go into that city to fight. But God came with a divine strategy. Because Joshua recognized that in spite of me, this is God's battle. And the moment I am willing to conform is because the last thing he said was, what's the instruction you bring from the master? And until we cultivate staying in the secret place to get the instructions and the strategy, we cannot win some battles of life. Now, the reason that happened is because Joshua was not used to the secret place fight of the battle. How do I know this? You see, when Joshua was going to fight the battle, and Moses and Aaron and Caleb, I believe, went to the mountain top, right? And they held up Joshua, and Moses held up his hand, and the sun stood still. Right? It was Moses. Joshua was in the battlefield. So I'm sure that in his mind, he felt that it was the strength of his sword that was conquering that city. But the Bible says that every time Moses' hands came down, they lost the battle. That's how I know that resources does not trump strategy. For that war, the strategy was a secret place. And I said, I and I said asking myself, you know, a lot of time we say secret place, secret place. How many people are confused about what this secret place idea is? Okay, who can define the secret place for us? The mic is open. Secret place. The secret place is a place of constant communion with God. Hallelujah. Please give him a round of, after all, you do not stand up to talk. So, so give him a round of applause. Yeah, that's actually ap accurate. The secret place can be anywhere. It can be in the bus. It can be in your bathroom. Um, uh, someone asked me that, is it okay to talk to God in the toilet? Is it not like disrespectful? You know, I'm pooping, I'll just be talking to God. Don't worry, God does not mind the smell of your poop. <laughs> I think it's okay with it. So the secret place is not a particular location. It's just anywhere that you can shun distraction and have a communion with the Father. So for that particular battle, Moses' secret place was on the mountaintop. And it's at the secret place that you get the strategy to win certain battles. So the angel came and he told... Um, um, Joshua, the strategy. Pastor Shoba is not even keeping time. I'm trying to round off. Another thing I learned while reading about it is that you, aside from being able to, to discern and recognize the voice of God when it takes on varying forms as it sometimes will, is the ability to understand how to distribute your responsibilities accurately. There are some battles that God will fight for you. There are some battles that you need to stand up and fight. And until you are able to discern his voice, you will not be able to know those ones that you need to draw a sword and those ones that you just need to walk around six times. And I found it very interesting that he did not tell them to walk around seven times. Just when I, I think they must have been getting comfortable, like, I got this on lockdown. All we do every day is silently walk around six times. God switched the strategy. Because if he does not switch the strategy, you will sometimes think that the strength of man have gotten you that victory. So God in his wisdom will switch the strategy. Why? To keep you hungry and thirsty after him. To keep you pursuing him. To keep you panting after him. Because that's all he wants at the end of the day. The purpose of creating man at the Garden of Eden was for fellowship. 
I've come to tell someone this morning, you are not alone. God is in this battle with him, with you. But you need to be able to recognize his voice even when he takes on a form that you are not familiar with. And the only way to be able to recognize his form and the voice is to fellowship with him. You know, during World Wednesday, I think someone asked the question, um, and I was about devotionals. And I was explaining that it's, there's nothing wrong with devotionals. But the problem is, you get the digested product of someone else's meditation, as it is with a Sunday service. So the point of a service is to give you a guideline. The Bible says that the Berean Christian, they will go back and study the word. Because if all you do is hear God's love's voice every Sunday, the only person that will be able to recognize him is the member of his choir. Even their conductor did not know his God law. Because the, their own is even better. Because choir hears him at least two times a week. Yet only one person was able to recognize him when your senses are short. And sometimes the devil will attack your senses. After all, that's what he came to do to Jesus. He said, see the world. When you see the world and blinds your sight to the things that God is doing, are you still able to pick his voice? The devil will not come with on on his head. It will come with things that you can see things that you can hear. He will try to sort out the voice of God with your human senses. But beyond your human senses, are you still able to pick him? Pick him in the silence. Pick him in the noise. Pick him in the crowd. Are you able to pick him? And when someone is speaking like him but is not him, are you able to discern it? Because until we are able to do so, Joshua the wall of Jericho might not be conquered with a sword, but it will be conquered with a shout. So, my time is up. I hope you get that. If you got that, say amen. amen. Hallelujah. Okay, so I wanted us to do a bit of question and answer. Because I realized that we've been out of church for a while, and oftentimes we might have questions that have gone unanswered. Maybe like, why did God allow coronavirus? Maybe Pastor Shogo can answer that. <laughs> you know, but I want us for the next few minutes, um, the mic will open, the choir, the male in the choir will run at the speed of light. So if you have a question, maybe even you don't understand Joshua, please go ahead. But I just felt like as a youth church, it would be good to, be, to interact this a little bit so that we can get perspective. And oftentimes when you ask questions, you are able to get more meat to what you have heard. And that's why I decided to keep it short. My note is long. You can see, right? Okay, so I said to keep it short. So any questions? You know what happens when you say question and answer? And everybody will keep quiet until the first person. Then everyone takes a cue. But let's not do that. We have just 10 minutes more. And I did that deliberately. So do we have questions? What has been burning in your heart this lockdown that you have been at home? Or you have questions that you want God to answer? Why me? Why not me? Does anyone have a question? Yes, please. Please run. You are a young person. Hallelujah. So, um, good morning, church. Um, so, this is my question. How do, uh, how do we explain or how do I really understand that God is good? I understand that I'm alive. I understand I have, a, I, I have the, probably the basic needs of life. But how is God truly good in all these things that is going on? You see people that just died just because of um, probably a mistake from someone or they got infected by the virus. And you're telling me God is good. So how is God good in all this situation? And I pray and I still die. Hello, can you hear me? Now, the truth is, um, no matter how you see it, no matter where you see it from, 
God is good. Now, if you look at you as, as a person, the fact that, you know, um, why, why are you not infected with the virus? No, why? Is it by your doing? No, Asana. Well, um, I don't know if I'm... Uh, first of all, am I allowed to talk? Yeah, please. Yeah? Okay, so... According to NCDC, I kind was infected with the virus. A what? I was infected with the virus. Okay. Yeah. So you have infected with the virus. Yeah. But you are still alive today. Yes. And the same virus has killed other people. Yes. Why do you think God, do, you, do you think there was something special about you? No, I don't. Because there was special. other people that were in the same position, Christians, you know, um, tongue speaking, you know, and, you know, so there's, there's a place for his grace and his mercy, right? There are some, you know, even this morning, this question that you asked, now, I didn't ask, I didn't say God, why, God is good, no, 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 my question was, why do some things happen? That was my question to God this morning, I said, God, why, why do some things just, you know, and one of the things he said was, you know, this is where my almighty, they, when they call me the almighty, do you understand? The, the, the all-knowing. Where's the place? When, when they say somebody's the almighty, where's the place for the almighty? If you know everything, that is why he's the almighty. Do you know, since all the years I've been reading Bible in this life, I never knew that even if a man or a woman hates me in this life, eh, they are not my enemy. They are not my enemy, oh. I, they, they are not my enemies. Because the Bible says we wrestle not against flesh and blood. But principalities and powers, rulers of darkness. Is a spirit behind what they do. They are not, human beings are not your enemy. Human beings are not your enemy. Spirits control humans. So is those spirits gone, gone? Those are your real enemies. The spirits that are controlling people to be to act in anyhow. So to your question, the truth is, there are so many questions all of us have, I'm sure. You know, but every time we see different things, you know, have you ever been to a beach before and you look at, try it if you've never done it before. Sit down, look at the horizon, look at the beauty, look at the splendor. You know, when you see that, that's one of the things that always makes me remember every time you know, I'm, I'm in a doubt. I always say, God, huh, who knows the end of the sea? Who can measure it? Is, is there any human born that can measure it? You can measure the length of the sea. Or you can tell when the tide will turn. You can't. Those things help you realize that there's an almighty person up there. And he wills to do. The Bible says, he can please, he, can, he, gives, uh, he shows compassion to who he wants to show compassion to. He shows mercy on who he wants to show mercy on. You know, so whatever you, whatever way you want to look at it, God is good. God is good. The wills of humans, the choices of human beings have brought us to where we are today. Thank you, Pastor Shoba. Please give him a round of applause. Um, you know, when Pastor Shoba was talking, I know there's a question online, but before we take it, when Pastor Shoba was talking, something else that came to my heart is, what makes you think that God is not good? God is good, one, because he says he's good. And if God, if God tells us good night right now, the sun will have no choice but to rescind and the moon will come out because he has that creative ability. Another question is, why do you think that God is not good to you or God is not fair to you? Sometimes we assume, and I'll give you a practical example. Now, when my mom passed on, I had questions because I didn't understand. We were praying for her not to die. But when I began to ask God questions, God reminded me of something she had said. That instead of me to become a burden to any child, I would rather God takes me home. And just before she died, she was hypertensive and she was already paralyzed on her left leg. And the doctor had said, okay, she was getting better, but she would need rehabilitation. But with her own mouth, 
she had decided what her end was, regardless of what people that loved her were praying for. Now, sometimes we pray for people not to die. But God in his mercies understand that at that point, it was better to call them home than for them to go through the pain that they, were, they would have to go through. Because we have varying strength. And while both of us might be infected with the same thing, and you will be able to repercurate easy, the process of repercuration might drain my faith and my belief in God. And because God loves you so much, he does not want you to lose that. He calls you home. We think that God is unfair. We think that God is not good. But the person and God will judge him as good. So let's not be quick to go, judge God as unfair or fair. Rather, let's go to him with our questions and he would answer. I remember that when Pastor Bimbo died, I don't know if this story was true or not, but I'm sure Pastor Shoba can corroborate. And people were praying that she should come back to life and blah, blah, blah. And someone said she saw a vision. That Pastor Bimbo said, don't pray for me. I'm with my father. I don't want to come back. So you would judge God as unfair. But the person and God knows that God is good. Do we understand what I'm saying? So when you have questions like that, that's why the secret place is good. Take it to God and be silent. It would explain why he has taken certain decisions. Because there is no evil in God. We might not understand it, but absolutely no evil in God. So sometimes he also sees the end that you don't see. And he feels, instead of you getting to that end, that's what happened to Moses. Moses, you've messed up. I can't take you to the promised land. So come to the mountain. Till today, they have not seen the remains of Moses' body. Who knows where Moses was buried? Because God looked at the situation. I said, because I'm a just God, if I say I should judge you by your action, you would die like the other thousand of Israelites that died in the wilderness, Right? Because he was amongst those generations. The only two people that escaped the justice of God was Joshua and Caleb. Now, because Moses sinned with the children of Israel, he should have been judged. And the judgment should have been that he would also have been wiped out for the new generation. Correct? Bible scholars, correct? But God in his mercy, understanding that Moses, you have worked with me too much. You have seen me face to face. Instead of you dying in the wilderness like everyone else, come to the mountain and I'll take you home. And that's why Jesus was able to see Moses on the mountain of transfiguration. Because the body of Moses is yet to be found. Right? So on the mount of transfiguration, Jesus saw Moses and Elijah. Because Elijah was also taken up. Elijah said, I'm tired. God said, you are tired? No problem. Come to this destination where I will take you from. The other sons of the prophets would have said, God is unfair. Because people were telling Elijah, God is going to take your master from you. That means he's unfair, right? But God and Elijah and Elisha would have judged God good and faithful. So there's no unfaithfulness in God. I also wanted to add, you know, when you look at the disciples and some of the people that worked with God so closely, have you ever read the accounts of their death? Oh my God, Horrible horrible. Look at John the Baptist that was calling on Jesus, who is supposed to be a forerunner of Jesus, was beheaded. All of us are seeing things that are happening in the north. We are shouting, you know. This one was somebody, I mean, in that kind of situation, people then, what would they say? God, ah, uh -uh, this one is a forerunner of Jesus. Or Stephen, that was stoned to death. Meanwhile, the person that was stoning him, when they were stoning him to death, the person that was supervising the stoning was Paul who became chief terrorist, who became, <laughs> who became the person that wrote three quarters of the Bible. How do you explain that? That's why I always say, leave the opportunity for the almightiness of God. You know, one of the things about us as Christians is the fact that we want to be the alpha in deciding, like what Pastor Bishop once said, you know, we want to be the one, the alpha of the will, you know, and the omega of how it is going to happen. Leave that space for God. And I even feel to some extent that this season actually helped us 
to see who we are in Christ Jesus. Personally, your relationship. Because a lot of people have been so used to a familiar voice that they don't even know the voice of God. So what that did was separate you to where you listen and hear the true voice, the voice of God. Hallelujah. Next question. Yeah, there's a question online. It said, how do we explain death? How do we comfort people who lose loved ones? It seems rather insensitive to tell them that it is the will of God. Hmm. That's deep. But Pastor Bisi has more experience than me. I've lost a loved one, but I know that Pastor Bisi is more experienced than me in this. She's lost her dad at a very young age, and her mom as well. So she, she, she can. I lost my dad when I was a bit. I don't think that matters anyway. Um, how, how do you comfort them? Um, I think that sometimes um, silence speak a thousand words. Um, sometimes you don't have to find the right words. You just have to be there. Um, when I lost my mom, I really can't. I, I, I know I've shared it before that um, for the longest of time, I used to come to church. I remember. I used to come to church and I used to enter church. We used to stay outside. And we'd just buy toast bread and drinks and just eat. And when they share the grace, I'll go home because I came to church because if I told my family members I'm not coming to church, they would take me for deliverance. So I came to Mark Register. But in my heart, I knew there was a problem with my, because I had questions that were unanswered. Um, but I would never forget the fact that I had friends that, they didn't preach to me or ask me if I backslidden, but they ate the toast bread and they bought it sometimes. They ate the toast bread and the drink and the fried peppered meat with me and stayed outside with me I missed hearing the service and sometimes walked me to my house, not saying any words in particular, but their presence was enough solace for me to keep coming back to church. So for someone, person that asked online, sometimes you might not find the right words. Sometimes it's okay to ask God to give you the right words. And if you do, it would give you. Um, there is no one size fits all rule to comforting whoever has lost a loved one. But one thing I know is that your presence speak a thousand words. Be there. Just be there. Just a rub on the shoulder. Just letting the person understand that I'm here and I love you. That sometimes might be all the person needs. Um, I think that's the question, right? How do you comfort someone? Yeah. Also, sorry, just to add to that. Also realize that it is only God that can heal, right? Um, the healing process can be very tough. Um, but it's only God that can heal. The truth is, I always say it, you know, I don't know if Pastor Bishop is going to break my head for this, but I always say it, there are some deaths that do not need to happen if there's a system that is working, which is why every, every one of us has a part to play in Nigeria. You know, the day I started thinking about it was the day they stabbed a young girl who was just coming from work, gentle girl, walking from work with her laptop because they wanted to steal laptop. They stabbed her on the neck. Do you understand? Number one, no street lights. Is that God's fault? No. It's the system. Number two, insecurity. Stole, they stole her laptop, now stabbed her. They took her to the hospital. Hospital rejected, first hospital rejected her. Second hospital, by the time she got there, she called her father that, Daddy, I'm dying. Before you knew it, she was dead. How do you want to explain that? That's not, it's not, you, is that God's will? No, that's the system. Just break down the system. Which is why I'm very passionate about Nigeria. What do we do, young people? The system. Right now, I don't pray, pray for presidents, uh, governors. No, what I pray for is now, Father, send us reformers. Send us that young man that is going to go into government or is going to go into that hospital, be DG of NAVDAC, and we say, no, we're not going to do this. You know, That's going to put their foot down. That's what we need. We need reformers in different sectors, power sector, health sector, education sector. That's what we need. We need reformers, and you are those reformers. Don't go in, don't be in your office and say you want to still collect bribe. You want to do what they are doing. No, that's part of the system. You are corrupting the system. So let's recognize that, you know, there's a part of the system, the will of God, you know, yeah, but God is the only one that can heal 
somebody that has lost somebody. The healing is God's to do. It's not a man's thing. It's not a man's uh, 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 work to heal any man. No matter how coach you are an emotional intelligence coach, no matter who you are, you can only help patch, you know. You can never deliver that person from that hurt. No, it is only God that can heal that person. So please, let's leave that place of God and say, you know what, pray for them, you know. And I'm not saying you should go there and say, God will heal you. God, no, no, no. Pray for, intercede for them in your own closet, right? Sometimes all people just need in that kind of situation is just a hug. Just a hug. That's, that's all. Sometimes. Sometimes they just want you to sit down just looking at them. I've been there. My, I was just numb. I was just numb. Like, because when I lost my father, I was just numb. Because it really, till today, I still feel pained because I never saw him before he died. You know, he, when he was going to hospi- being rushed to the hospital, um, he told them to call me. So they called me, and then I asked to see him. And his wife said, I can't see him. You know, like, because I, fe- I always felt like if I go there and leave my hands on him, he will come back to life. But I never got a chance to see him. That's even more painful. Do you understand? And then the next time, I got to I got to hear that he was dead. Somebody just called me randomly. Ah, your father is dead, oh. Just imagine. I just said, what? It's 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 it's, it's I mean you can't explain it. I didn't even cry even at the the day I cried was like a, a week after. You know, I just saw like I saw his picture and I like I just lost it. You know, so it's only God. I think now I, I'm in a better place, you know. But it's only God that can, you know, do that. Any more questions? Um, I said now people will be saying questions. And then it's okay to cry. So if they are crying, don't tell them not to cry, please. It's okay to cry. Um, I think this will be the last question because of time. Okay. <laughs> um, I need clarity when it comes to the fact that when people die, I understand that God would... <laughs> judge people on the last day and everything. But when someone dies and the person is a Christian and a believer, does the person go straight to God and without being judged? Is like I don't understand the final judgment and the is the person judged immediately after death before going to Christ? Pastor is the person judged immediately. I think we'll go to theological school. Um okay, so the, I, I think I've heard some theologians argue that the person got judged immediately. And some people say, no, they have, you know, the Bible says that we have clouds of weaknesses. So um, there's the argument that they stay in the clouds of weaknesses until the final judgment day where everyone will be judged. So those are the two theological arguments. You can pick the one that, that you think answers your question. But the question is, will everyone be judged? Yes. Are they being judged right now as they die? Some theologians say so. But the Bible says there is a final judgment day. So you can follow the Bible or follow other theologians. Amen. All hearts and mind cleared. Hallelujah. Have we been blessed today? You know, while, while Pastor Shoba was talking about we going into the world and occupying systems, I remember something that Pastor said after first service, not in the church, outside. Um, it was explaining well, to some of us that in, th- in Tanzania, they never locked down their, their country. There was never a lockdown. Because their president is a Christian. And he said that he doesn't feel God telling him that they should shut down the country. They didn't shut down. And their numbers did not skyrocket. You see why it's good as Christians to discern the voice of God, irrespective of what the world is saying. And be bold enough to take action on what you are hearing God say to you at that time. He could have followed the crowd. Everyone shut their system, but he didn't. Have we all not opened or joined them? God will help us to hear him clearly. He's a pa- no, he's an usher in, in this church. He's not a pastor. He's an, he's an usher and he's still ushering. Talk about humility and dedication. God will help us in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We give you all the glory. We thank you for the time in your presence. We thank you for helping us get clarity to the questions that we have. And we thank you for the grace to discern and hear your voice and meet the noise and the um, fanfare around us in the name of Jesus. 
and we thank you for the grace to cultivate the secret place. We give you all the glory and honor and adoration. In Jesus' name we pray. Thank you.